The final episode of season one of The Wheel of Time is here. Episode eight out of eight. I mentioned this in my episode seven review. The Wheel of Time show had the opportunity here to extend the momentum from a very well received episode seven and set this series up for the future and go into season two on a strong note. The ending to The Eye of the World in the books is confusing to many. So there was going to be some leeway given here by the fandom to rewrite this ending. One of the few times fans may be on board with big changes. But did they deliver? Is Eye of the World fantasy at its best? Or is it a major dud? Now join me today as I break down what I loved, what I didn't, and try to answer the question of how well Episode 8 ended the season for The Wheel of Time. So before we get started, apologize up front. I have been sick with a sinus infection all week, so you're going to have to deal with this. But let's get right into it. Let's thank the video sponsor, Bespoke Post, but more on them in a bit. Let's also hit the spoiler warning for the video. Today's video will carry a spoiler rating of red, with major spoilers running all the way through episode 8 of the Wheel of Time TV show. I'm going to try to keep this book spoiler free other than a few references here and there to some changes from the books and general lore. I'll for sure get into more spoilers in future videos, but let's talk about this episode. I have so many thoughts. I got access to this episode a couple days early as I was a part of a live watch event with Nerdist on Thursday, and I literally had to watch this like three or four times before I could accurately convey my feelings about it. I walked away from the episode excited for the future, and dismally upset with some of the choices and the execution from the finale. So without burying the lead, this was not the best outing for the Wheel of Time TV show, and certainly not all that I had hoped for in the finale. I'll convey most of my thoughts towards the end of the video, but I had some major issues with this episode that move beyond even changes from the plot of the books. That being said, there are plenty of things that I liked, so let's start with those things that I loved from the episode. First, let's start with that cold open. I am such a huge fan of the Age of Legends, in fact, I made two videos about the Age of Legends that you can check out if you want. I've always found it super interesting, and I love the sci-fi aspect to the Wheel of Time that seamlessly fits with the fantasy elements. So seeing a flashback to the Age of Legends and actually seeing La Trapose Decume meeting with Luz Theron Telemon, I loved that quick shot of the landscape of a city from the Age of Legends. You had Joe cars and show wings and all kinds of Age of Legends stuff. Presumably that's a city called Parandesan. I was also a fan of how we saw them speak the old tongue and how well executed that was. This was all very well done, and I think it added to the world building to have another language within the world. Another thing I was happy to see was Lan and Nynaeve having a brief moment and a famous set of lines that were pulled almost straight from the books. I did wish we had seen Lan give Nynaeve a very specific ring here, but I suppose that can wait. But nevertheless, I like the development of this relationship. And for those saying that it's moving too fast, it actually moves faster in the books aside from the sexy time in last episode, but they did spend a month together riding to Tarvalin and hanging out every night. I don't think it felt rushed. It's the type of thing that has to happen in shows like this. I was all for it. Another thing I loved about this episode was pretty much all of Rand's plot line in the episode. This was all very well done in my opinion. Rand and Moraine's conversations as they walked through the Blight were great. The simultaneous respect he has for her but yet complete mistrust is evident, and it really mirrors their relationship in the books. I thought after an episode of them walking together that I would actually love to see the two characters interact even more. I could see like a buddy comedy with them. Rand's interactions, though, with the man representing the Dark One here, and I put it that way for non-book readers. Book readers will know what is going on here. If you want to know too, go read the books. But I really liked their interactions and the changes from the books here. This had a very manipulative arc to it. Moraine and Rand were very deftly guided into a very carefully laid trap. I love that this played out the way that it did. I'll explain more in my breakdown video, but the events that occurred were exactly what the Dark One wanted to happen. Rand was able to break cracks in the Dark One's prison, thinking that he was in fact defeating the Dark One. This is going to have a lot of impact on future plots and new villains in the story, and I'm a huge fan of the way that that was done. Rather than this being a victory, as Rand initially thinks that it is, it's really a defeat. This was really do well done in concept, and I think it was pretty well executed. With the smile from the Dark One as he disappears, and the giant cracks in the unbreakable floor that they are standing on. The scenes where the Dark One tempts Rand were pretty close to what happens in the books, albeit a little differently with different characters, but they're also using the same mechanics in-world to make that happen. And 
not going to get into that for the sake of plot spoilers, but they're using the same mechanism here. The ending was slightly less confusing than the books, but I think it opens up far more questions and far more plot lines. So I think that was a positive. A couple things that I want to hit on also that I really liked. First, Hot on Fane is much scarier in the show, and that's something that I said very early on that I wanted. I really like what they've done with him, and Johan Myers has been really, really good. The swagger with which he carries himself has been awesome. There's some clunkiness to the parts involving him at the end of the episode, but I'll address those in a minute. But I don't think they take away from his performance and the overall feel of his character. This is what I really wanted out of Fane, and I really wish they did more with him, actually. And the last thing I want to mention is actually something that I have mixed feelings on in the execution of, which again, I'll talk about in a moment, but I love the arrival of the ships at the end of the episode. I'm excited for what that teases and what they represent. And to avoid spoilers, these peeps will change the game. And as you can see by their introduction, they are not exactly friendly. But before we transition to what I did not like from the episode, I wanted to give a quick shout out to the video sponsor, Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is a subscription box service that sends you out a special gift box each month that contains stuff that their algorithm has determined that you will like based on a survey you take when you sign up for the service. I've had them for over a year now, and I personally love all the stuff I get. I use most of it all the time. What's great is that you get stuff that you would not have thought that you would love, and then you end up becoming a huge fan of it. I've got cooking equipment, stuff for my home bar, tools, and this month I received these fur scented candles. Now I'm a huge candle person in general, and these smell absolutely amazing. You know that pine and fur smell you get with a Christmas tree? Well, these are like that, but with a unique twist. They're absolutely amazing. I've actually burned through one of them already. I got four in this box. They are awesome. The Spoke Post is, is great. You should check them out. Just click the link in the description of the video. Get signed up for their service. If you don't like the box that they're gonna send you that month, you can always tell them to skip it and they won't charge you for it. Or you can switch it out for their dozens of other boxes they've got put together as well. It's a great feature and it makes sure that you're always going to love what you get. And by signing up for the service, you not only get awesome stuff from them, but you also help support the channel. So thank you, Bespoke Post. And now let's get back to the video. So it's time to talk about the things I didn't like. And unfortunately, there are quite a few of them in this episode. So let me start with a very high level reason I thought the episode failed in some respects. First of all, Eye of the World's book ending has the entire group going to the Eye of the World, but the majority of them are just basically spectators to a version of what you saw happen with Rand's plotline. That would not make very compelling television to watch all of the main characters stand there and watch Rand, so they needed to leave them behind or give them something else to do, and that makes tons of sense, and I thought that was a wise choice that they attempted that. But this is also where they failed miserably in my opinion. What exactly did they do? Perrin just stands around and mopes and eventually helps dig up the Horn of Valir. Egwene and Nynaeve just get used as batteries for a wannabe Aes Sedai. The battle itself was underwhelming, which I'll talk about here in a moment. Loyal helps Perrin and then gets stabbed off screen. Lan is just running through a forest and we see absolutely nothing of him fighting in any way. Lan is the biggest badass in the Wheel of Time world as a fighter. And we have seen maybe two episodes where he's done anything and really only one of them where he was featured. And that was way back at the beginning. He has not done very much kicking ass here. This is one of the main examples of the squandered chance they had to approve upon the books here. They could have given our main characters leadership roles or important activities, rather than being pawns to other people and being led around. There just weren't really any arcs for these characters. I'll talk more about this in some of my whole season breakdown, but some of the characters didn't have arcs for the season really at all. But let's get to some specifics here. The Battle of Tarwin's Gap was a major disappointment. I would have just rather this happened all off screen if they couldn't do this justice. For example, in Game of Thrones early seasons or in the HBO show Rome, which was the first super high budget TV show, if they couldn't show the scale of a battle, they just had it happen off screen and then we dealt with the effects from it with our main characters. I would rather have seen that. If this was supposed to be 10,000 Trollocs, I would expect them to be able to match at least 10 minutes of the Battle of Helm's Deep from the Lord of the Rings movies. That was made 20 years ago. It didn't need to be on that scale entirely, but the tension didn't feel as strong as it could. The effects felt unfinished, and there weren't enough defenders as extras, and the Trollocs looked really unfinished as CGI. The scenes of Amalisa and Egwene and Nynaeve channeling, they looked okay, but frankly, they were ridiculous in a sense to me. Amalisa is possibly just an accepted, if that, 
and she was able to not only link with some channelers and then wipe out an entire battlefield. Without getting into spoilers, this level of power isn't seen until much, much later in the books, and not by her, and seemingly it was done for the sake of the plot rather than staying to the lore and the rules of the world. We'll come back to that topic in a moment. My biggest issue here was Nynaeve's death, and then apparently either resurrection or sadness-based healing by Egwene, somebody who is not noted for having much ability as a healer. In fact, she's said to be a very weak healer. So that was very manufactured drama to me that was done for the sake of drama, not for the sake of being realistic to the story. Not for one minute did I think Nynaeve was dead, in the same way that I do not believe Loyal is dead. In fact, He's even still moving in the last shots that we see his body in. Now look, there are reasons for all of this. The COVID delays were a problem. COVID was never not an issue for this shoot, specifically in the Czech Republic, where there were major issues, even when they came back for their final reshoots. The idea that they could put out a call and get thousands of extras to show up was never going to happen because of the COVID restriction. That has to play into the lack of extras to make this battle feel larger. Like, they needed hundreds and hundreds of defenders that they could multiply with CGI just to make that battle feel larger in scale. Additionally, it felt really rushed out, frankly. Like, I think Amazon wanted this out when it was, and then the post work on this episode was lacking, and it was poorly done. It wasn't edited well. Some of the CGI was unfinished. Also, I kn we know there were major issues when Barney did not return to the production. They had last-minute rewrites that were basically causing a frenzy and it made the entire last episode feel clunky when it probably should not have. The scenes with Perrin and Fane were probably written for Barney, and were likely far different than what we see here. But at the end of the day, none of those reasons matter. This is a show, and the product is the product, and we judge things based on what we get, not the reasons why we didn't get what we wanted. This episode left me feeling very much wanting. Now, I don't think this means much in the scheme of things. There were some great episodes this season, and it was a solid start, albeit not the start I would have wanted. This episode had the chance to have us dying for the next season out of anticipation. I'm still excited for season two, make no mistake, but we're limping there story-wise rather than rushing in on a high. They can easily make this completely forgotten by a stellar season two. Honestly, the ending of Eye of the World, the book, is pretty awful, and it's pretty much forgotten once you jump into book two. In fact, you're so hooked on the story by the point that you get to the book one ending that the confusion at the ending is less relevant. And that's sort of how I feel here. This wasn't a great ending, but it's not so bad that I'm done with the series. There's some strong foreshadowing of what's to come. There's some strong setup for future plot lines. And I'm very excited to see what will happen when they have a non-COVID shooting schedule, a full set of actors that stay throughout the season, access to as many extras as they want, and some more cohesive writing. Let's hope they get all of those things. As well, they get a couple years of experience and some fan feedback. My biggest concern, and I'll address this in my series wrap-up and review video, is the writing drift into writing for the sake of plot than rather than writing true to the rules of your world. This is what happened in Game of Thrones in its final seasons. They knew what they wanted to have happen plot-wise or visually, so rather than needing it to make sense, they just did it. People teleported across continents that would take months to travel across. Characters made completely out-of-character decisions simply to advance the plot. You see this in the Wheel of Time in something that I actually mentioned as something I liked early. This may come across as a nitpick, but the appearance of the ships at the end, while I did like it for what it represents, there is no way those people would have shown up with a tidal wave for a little girl. Yes, it shows they're bad peeps, and that wasn't a very nice thing to do. And they aren't very nice people but that would entirely defeat the purpose of their appearance and their motivations and beliefs about why they are there in the first place. It doesn't actually make sense to their rules as a society. It's just a cool visual. That's the type of stuff that can kill a show eventually. But again, I'll mention this more in my season one breakdown. None of this were deal breakers yet, but I'm cautious about where they're headed with it, and I don't want to see that trend continue. So it's time for a score for this episode. And as negative as I have been on it, there were some redeemable moments and some things that I thought were really well done, considering the problems they had to deal with. This was by far the worst episode of the season for me, but it wasn't terrible, terrible. I would give this episode a 5 out of 10. I don't think it was awful, but it was just a massive disappointment as to what it could have been in my opinion. Look forward to my full series review where I'll get into some of this a little bit more. And I'll be going back to finish my individual episode breakdown videos that I've been waiting on until now to get back to. Those will be full spoiler and we'll have all the Easter eggs and whatnot. But what did you think of the episode? Am I being too harsh? 
let me know in the comments of the video. I'm interested to hear your civil takes. Anyways, thanks for watching. Make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release new Wheel of Time content. There is a ton more to come. And now with the show over, I'll be getting back to some more lore-related content. Thanks to everybody for watching, and until next time, peace out. Thank <laughs> you.